Repo market update. Is the entire financial system broken? I'm gonna answer that for you in three simple, fast steps. Step number one, we're gonna go over the numbers, which you will be shocked to know have increased dramatically. <laughs> then we're gonna go over why the Fed has increased those numbers. December 13th to December 30th, they're gonna inject 120 billion a night at a minimum. December 30th to the 1st or the 2nd of January, they're doing a one day settlement repo. I call this the SBZR, which is the Special Bonus Zoltan repo. Moving on to December 31st to January 2nd, 150 billion a night they're committing to. The third to the 14th, they're going back to a meager 120 billion a night. So why are they doing this? Why have they upped it from 120 to 150? And why are they doing the special bonus Zoltan repo of 75 billion? And I wanna point out one thing, that Zoltan's report came out on December 9th. And if you didn't see that video, check that out. We posted that yesterday. But the Fed's new report on the changes that they're making to their repo transactions came out December 12th. <laughs> so what this means is it's blatantly obvious that the Fed is behind the curve. And that is the one thing that Zoltan and Jeff Snyder both agree on. It looks like right here that they're just getting their cues from Zoltan's report. Moving on to the Fed's rationale for increasing the repos, let's quickly go over the plumbing. Got the Fed, we've got the government, we've got the primary dealers that are under the Fed's umbrella. The primary dealers keep their reserves on hand with the Fed, which are getting very low. The repo market is the pawn shop for this whole financial system. We have hedge funds, financial institutions, the bond market, and the FX swap market. FX swap market could potentially be offering a very attractive yield, let's say 10%. That's not the exact number, but we're using that for the hypothetical example. The bond market only offering 2%. If the reserves of the bank are extremely low and they see this super fat yield there that's just staring them in the face, that's going to motivate the primary dealers and the financial institutions to sell treasuries to get cash to pump into the FX swap market to take advantage of that profit opportunity. The Fed doesn't want this because all that selling back into the bond market would increase this 2% yield. So you could imagine if all the capital flows from the bond market into the FX swap market, the interest rate here goes down to 5%, and then the interest rate here goes up to let's say 5% as well. And again, these are just numbers I'm using for the example. What would happen if the 10-year treasury went to 5%? That would be complete chaos for the US economy. The Fed knows that. That's why Zoltan thinks they're gonna come in with QE4. But what Zoltan isn't thinking through is that the entire US economy is based on asset prices, debt, and confidence. And if the Fed comes in and actually announces that they're doing QE4, that's going to destroy confidence. Why is that? Because the last 10 years, the confidence in the system has revolved around the Fed's perceived ability to manage the economy. And part of that management system was quantitative easing. Well, if we see that the emperor has no clothes and that quantitative easing actually doesn't work, the house of cards tumbles to the ground. So the Fed is really between a rock and a hard place. The only thing they can do is inject massive amounts of liquidity into the repo market, even more than they were before. The 75 billion, taking the 120 up to 150 billion a night in hopes that the financial institutions and everyone that wants to take advantage of this attractive yield in the FX swap market, instead of selling treasuries to get the cash to do that, they'll borrow the Fed's money that they've injected into the repo market. If they take that money from the repo market into the FX market, 
That means that there's no forced selling on treasuries and the interest rate stays at 2% instead of going way up to 5%, which would crash the system. Step number two, signs of a broken system. Let's start by understanding how the Fed sets the Fed funds rate. This is the rate of interest banks charge each other to lend and borrow overnight. This isn't the repo market. That's something completely different. This is just the lending market for banks that are under the umbrella of the Federal Reserve. In the past, before the great financial crisis, if the Fed wanted the rate to go from 5% down to 4%, very simple supply and demand. The Fed would print the money out of nowhere, just like they do today, nothing's changed. They go into the bond market, buy treasury bills. The entities that sold those treasury bills to the Federal Reserve would take that newly printed money, they'd deposit it in their account held at the Fed. That would increase the amount of cash that these banks have to lend to each other overnight. If there's more cash to lend, that's gonna bring down the interest rate. If the Fed wants that interest rate to go back up, they'll just do the opposite. They'll take those same treasury bills, they'll sell them back into the market. The entities will take down their cash position with their reserve accounts in order to buy those T-bills. If there's less cash now in the system, same amount of demand for overnight lending, that's gonna increase the interest rate. Since the great financial crisis, everything has changed. The Fed starts QE, which injects massive amounts of cash into the system. The banks take that cash and deposit it at their account with the Federal Reserve. That increases the amount of reserves so much that it would naturally bring that overnight rate or the Fed funds rate down to zero. This creates a problem for the Federal Reserve if they want the interest rate higher than zero. Let's say they wanted it 3%. So the Fed's solution that they came up with is IOR, interest on reserves. Basically what the Fed does is they go to the bank, say, listen guys, if you keep your money with us overnight, we'll pay you 3%. The banks say, oh, okay, that sounds good. Risk-free money, I'll take it. So then if bank B wants to borrow from bank A, bank A will only lend to bank B if bank B pays them more than the 3% risk-free that they're getting at the Fed. What the Fed does is they effectively create a floor to the level of interest. This completely eliminates the old school system that the Fed used prior to the great financial crisis or so we thought. Let's go to an article right now from CNBC that shows us this system might not be working as well as it seems. The title is The Fed is Ramping Up Its Repo Operations to Head Off Year-End Funding Issues. Pretty much everything we already discussed in step number one. Where it gets really interesting is toward the end of the article. And I think most people probably would just scan over this without paying it much attention. In addition to short-term repos, the Fed also is buying treasury bills. You notice that, guys? Treasury bills from the banks in an effort to make sure the central bank's benchmark funds rate, or Fed funds rate, stays within its target range. Did you get that, guys? The Fed had to go back to managing the Fed funds rate the way they did before the great financial crisis, and they're still managing that Fed funds rate with all this quantitative easing and interest on reserves. Well, you may be saying, well, what? How, how does that happen? I thought they had enough reserves in the system for the natural rate of interest to be at 0%. So if that's true, how come these banks aren't willing to lend to each other at 1.75%? The answer is because it's not that they don't have enough cash to lend to each other, it's that they don't want to lend to each other because the risk that they see in the system demands 
more than a 1.75% interest rate regardless of how much money they have to lend. The bottom line is the system, the way it is now, at a very best case scenario, is 100% reliant on quantitative easing. At a worst case scenario, the system is completely broken. Step number three, we go from signs of a broken system to proof of a broken system. This is a chart of excess reserves in the banking system. It starts at 1990, it goes to today. The bottom number is 400 billion, the top number is 2.8 trillion. So if you're looking at my argument so far, you may say to yourself, yeah, George, I get what you're saying, but the reserves have gone down quite a bit since they peaked in 2014 or 15. They were at 2.8 trillion, and now they're only 1.3 trillion. But you have to keep that in perspective. If you see the blue line starting right here, it's not because there were no reserves in the system. It's just there were so few that you can't even see the line. And the only thing you can see, editor, zoom in on this if you would for me, please, is this little teeny weeny blip right there in 2001. What was that? Let's go to the Federal Reserve's website and check it out. That blip, of course, was the Federal Reserve's response to the September 11 attacks. Let's look to see exactly what they did. The Fed's New York trading desk bought a very large amount of U.S. Treasury securities. And note they say very large, which is almost comical by today's terms. Either outright or through repo agreements. Does that sound familiar? These transactions provided liquidity to the markets by transferring money, a less liquid asset, to the public in exchange for treasury securities, a less liquid asset. The Fed held 61 billion of securities acquired under the repo agreements. Remember, now the Fed's balance sheet is north of 4 trillion and they're doing almost 500 in repos. So what did all of those extreme measures that are nothing, they're a drop in the bucket by today's standards, what did they do to the excess reserves of the banking system? Editor, let's go ahead and zoom in on that chart of 2001, September 12th. You'll see that the excess reserves went to a whopping 19 billion. 19 billion is what was required for quite possibly the biggest catastrophe in US history. Compare that 19 billion to today, we have 1.3 trillion. So if 9-11 was a catastrophe that warranted 19 billion, how big is the catastrophe that we have today that would warrant 1.3 trillion? Another way of looking at it is the Fed's current target rate is 1.75 to 1.5%. And people like Zoltan say this 1.3 trillion, well, it's just not quite enough to make that happen. The Fed needs to inject more liquidity into the system. But we can prove or disprove that empirically by going back in time before the great financial crisis. This isn't the first time that the Fed has targeted a rate of 1.75. The last time they did that was 2002. Then they needed 1.3 in the system to pull off that Fed funds rate. And you may say, well, George, that makes sense because today, to pull off the same Fed funds rate, they also need 1.3 in the system. But you would be very, very wrong. Back in 2002, they needed 1.3 billion, with a B, to pull that off. Today, they need 1,000 times more. 1.3 trillion 
in the system to pull off that same Fed funds rate. And remember, it's all about supply and demand. Supply has increased by 1,000 times. Does that mean that demand has also increased by 1,000 times? I don't think so. So the only other variable that we can have is willingness to lend. The willingness to lend has gone down at the same rate that the supply of excess reserves has gone up. Does this mean that the system is now broken? No. It means the system broke back in 2008 and it's still broken. For more information like this, check out this content right here and I will see you on the next video.